Cool, thank you. I think understanding how a database is processing transactions is one of the, if not the most important thing you need to know as a DBA. Because no developer will know this. And executing a query on your database or another database in exactly the same circumstances might give you a different result. And I think an easy way to talk about this is indeed by using roller coasters. Because in many ways, a database and being a DBA can feel like the database is actually the roller coaster. And being a DBA can actually feel like you're riding the roller coaster. If you're lucky, your days are like this, easy going. There's not that much going on. But on the other side, it's also a bit boring, right? I like it more when, when it goes more like this, making some speed. Some unexpected turn, maybe. But then, if you're in the wrong company, and uh, the days are like this, and it's like nothing goes on. And these are the days I don't like my job, to be honest with you. This is more like a database which is doing nothing at night, and you can actually turn it off, and it doesn't really matter. <laughs> this was uh, my insurance job. Now I'm working with Atien, and my job is more like this. And this is also how the database behaves. There are so many changes, there's so much going on. But there's one very important difference between a database and a roller coaster. Because if you are joining this ride from the roller coaster, everything is moving. But if you are looking at the database from a user perspective, it looks like this. <laughs> it doesn't move. There's a lot of stuff going on in your database. But as long as, you're, as long as you keep watching, nothing happens. But then you blink your eyes. You're like, what? what happened? This is not one step further. This is like a million steps in time. And then you blink your eyes again. And then you have a different perspective. It's the same roller coaster, but a different moment in time. But as a user, if you are querying a Postgres database, from your perspective, nothing is changed. Nothing is changing in time as long as you keep watching. And today is about how does the database actually do this? How does it provide these three different perspectives of the data at the same moment in time? Cool. So that's what we are talking about. This is me. My name is Derek van Veen. I'm working as a database engineer at Atien. I never know. Different titles, same job. Um, Atien has been working with Postgres for over 10 years. I think we have close to 1,000 developers, uh, thousands of tables, and we actually have many clusters, which are over 100 terabyte in size. Uh, so we have some pretty decent sized databases, I would say. And we are not, we're, we're not having the biggest databases, but we are doing financial transactions, so we might have the biggest critical databases. At least we're doing a pretty decent job here. Actually, my colleagues are making pictures of this. I'm slightly <laughs> surprised. <laughs> cool. So what are we talking about today? Uh, first of all, let's, let's talk about the definition of a transaction. It will be very hard to talk about the forest if we don't know what a tree is. Uh, so if we have the definition sharp, we can talk about individual transactions. And when we have one transaction, we can, use, uh, can take a look at a bunch of transactions. And then, well, also important, we have to know how to use these transactions. And I think one of the final pieces of the puzzle is we have to look at locks, uh, because it's also important if you're doing multiple, multiple things at the same time. And we have to take a look at isolation levels, but this will be very brief. So, fasten your seatbelts. This is the ride for today. Let's take a look at individual transactions. And I think there's a nice acronym to remember what a uh, transaction is. It's basically, it's just a unit of work. And this unit unit of work, you commit it entirely. So if you're doing three updates and you commit, you commit all three of them or none. It's atomic. Next one, it's consistent. A database has a lot of rules, uh, a primary key constraint, uh, check constraints, foreign key constraints, and you're not allowed to violate them. Then you run every transaction like it's the only transaction in your database. There might be a lot of stuff going on, but you just pretend to be the only one who's actually using the database. 
And then finally, if you commit a change, the database is not allowed to lose this change. This is the ACID acronym, and this is the way I think most people remember uh, uh, what a transaction on your database actually is. But today, we are talking almost exclusively about isolation. So, yeah, let's get started. How does a transaction work in practice? Let's take a look at some very easy transactions in your database. So we're doing a insert. Uh, so it would be nice to insert a single roller coaster into our database. Um, so today we are inserting the Baron. Uh, I have to admit, I know very little about uh, roller coasters, but apparently this is the most famous Dutch roller coaster. Um, I'm inserting this roller coaster into my database at timestamp 101. It's a completely arbitrary timestamp, but it's easier to talk about something if you give the number. So I'm inserting this roller coaster into my database, which means if I start a query before timestamp 101, I will not be able to see it. Yeah, of course, you didn't insert it. All right, makes sense. So if I query my database after this timestamp, so my transaction starts after timestamp 101, I will be able to see it. Easy, right? Building a database is really easy. Let's see what happens if we actually delete this roller coaster. It might be a nice Dutch roller coaster, but we still decide to delete it. So at timestamp 105, I actually delete this roller coaster from my database. So how does this impact the database? Well, if I start a query after timestamp 101, uh, 105, it has been deleted, so I will no longer be able to see this roller coaster. Still pretty easy. So let's sum it up. If I query this database and I start my query, and it's important, I start my query before timestamp 105, I will not be able to see the roller coaster because it has not been inserted. If I start my query between timestamp 101 and 105, I can see this roller coaster, I can see the brawn. But if my query starts after timestamp 105, I will no longer be able to see it because it has been deleted. Right, what action are we missing? Well, we are missing the update. And I would say there's no such thing as an update within Postgres. A update is basically an insert of something new and we delete something old. So if you're updating this nice red roller coaster, I'm just inserting a new picture and I'm dropping the old one. So the old picture can be gone and now I have a new version of the red roller coaster in my database. So let's say I do this update on timestamp 103. If I start a query before timestamp 103, I will be seeing this red roller coaster in the station. But if I start my SQL statement after timestamp 103, I see this climbing red roller coaster. So that's how we do updates. So let's create an overview of all my inserts and updates. If I can show it, yeah. Yeah, there it is. So between timestamp 101 and 105, we have the Baron, and we did an update of the Red Roller Coaster. Uh, we did it on timestamp 103. So if we now look at how does a database store all this information on disk, because at the end, that's what the database has to do. So we look at a database page. It's a page on disk with a page header and a footer. And there, of course, is our Baron. And the Baron is visible from timestamp 101 until timestamp 105. And then we need a picture of the red roller coaster because we updated at timestamp 103, but it was there before. So I picked timestamp 10, also just an arbitrary number somewhere in the past. And it was valid until timestamp 103. And then I have a, another picture of the same red roller coaster, which is valid from timestamp 103, and there's no end time. So there's, we don't know when we delete this or update this again. And now, if I query this page, and let's say I query at timestamp 100, then the database goes to this page and finds what images are valid at timestamp 100. Well, in this case, it's only the old picture of the red roller coaster. If I repeat the same process, but I, I just shift a little bit in time, timestamp 102, what will be visible? 
Well, it will be the Baron because it has been inserted one timestamp just before us, and I can still see the old picture of the red roller coaster. All right, another shift in time. Timestamp 106. Now the Baron has been deleted, so I will no longer, the database will no longer serve me the picture of the Baron. It's still on disk, but the database will no longer show it to me. It will only show the red roller coaster after the update. So this is how the database is able to serve different pictures in time to different users at the same time. I think it's a pretty nice concept. This is how it, a roller coaster doesn't seem to move as long as you keep watching. So now let's see how all these different transactions move together in space. How do we use the transaction space? Transaction space is basically, it's a collection of transaction snapshots. And a transaction snapshot is a bit of like a complicated way of putting like what is actually happening at this moment in time. So what do we need for a transaction snapshot? Well, we need to know what is the oldest transaction in time which has not yet been committed. Bec because everything which has been committed will be visible for me. It's like the brawn has been inserted in the past, so now I can see it. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we need to know uh, what is the first number which is still mine to give out. What timestamp is in the future, right? Because if something is in the future, I can't see it. Makes sense. Well, what's in between this oldest not committed and first not handed out timestamp? There's a list of things which might be active. Um, I will zoom into that in a bit. But because I think for a lot of people, this is a new concept, we go over slowly. So if you ask your database, give me my snapshot, your snapshot looks like this. Come on, move. Thank you. All right, first number, the oldest not committed transaction. This is the first one which is not visible for me as a user. Next number. Is it empty? I clicked a lot of times for this one, but... All right, in this case, this is the first available moment in time, 110, which will be in the future. So everything above this number, it's about to happen. I can't see it yes, yet. And next one, thank you. Next one is this list of numbers. This is stuff which is currently going on on my database, which means I can't see actually what's, what's happening in these numbers, these transactions IDs. So let's take a actual look at what happens on your database with transaction snapshot 100 which means the oldest not committed transaction number is 100. And the first one available is also 100. Well, that's a bit weird, right? Well, it makes sense because this system is completely idle. So what has been committed is everything before 100. So that's are the numbers 98 and 99 in this case. And the first number to be handed out is 100. So 100 and 101 are not visible to me. I think this is the very easiest snapshot you can get in your database. Nothing's going on. So we can also say like, yeah, everything below the oldest not committed number is in the past, and the other one, it's in the future. Now, let's shift the future a bit. Let's say 100 is still the oldest not committed number, but 104 is in the future. But there's nothing in between. There are no actively running transactions so what does this mean? Well, apparently, these numbers are visible, these numbers are not visible, but what's in between? What is the future? What transactions started after my transaction started? And can I actually see it? Well, they are not active, right? Is these numbers, 101 till 103, they have been committed. So apparently, I've been doing a transaction, I did a read operation, for example, for some time, and now I'm doing a second read operation, which means my transaction started earlier, but I can see now operations which started after me, but also finished before I started my new statement. I think this is a very important concept to realize. It's about when does a transaction start? That happens in order, but when transactions finish, that's not in a given order. All right. 
So make it, let's make it even a bit more complicated. So now we have a transaction snapshot with a all is not committed number of 101. The first number available for people is 110, but now I have two active transactions. So let's put the arrows in place. 101 is the first not committed transaction, which means it's actively running, so I can't see what happens in transaction 101. 110 is the first not handed out transaction number. If it's not handed out, I can't see it. Right. So I know now everything before 101 is visible and everything from 110 and above is invisible for me. Right. Now let's say I have transaction number 106. I'm doing some updates. Now let's see what happens with all the other numbers. Let's take a look at number 102. Transaction number 102 is not running, so it has been committed, so I can see it. Transaction 103 has been aborted. I didn't tell you about aborted transactions, but uh, we did a rollback on this transaction, that's why I created this red number in it, and I will not be able to see the result of a rolled back transaction. Then 104. 104 is in my list of active transactions. It's running, it's active, I can't see the result of transaction 104. 105 is not in my list with active transactions, meaning I can't see it. 106 is me, 107, it started after my transaction started and it is still running. I can't see what happens in transaction 107. But 108 and 109, these transactions are already finished. So I can actually see what the result of transactions which started with a higher transaction number. So I can kind of read in the future, but this has been committed before I started my current statement. Important to realize. And now I've been showing this like a straight line, like Postgres has a infinite number of transaction IDs, uh, but in reality, it's not the past, it's, it's more like a wheel. And we are handing out numbers increasingly, but there will be a maximum. I think Postgres is using a 32-bit integer number uh, to store these, uh, to store these uh, transaction IDs. And we just made an agreement, like half of these numbers are in the past and the other half is in the future. So every now and then we have to move the wheel around and we have to deal with future and present. So let's see how that works out in reality. So let's switch back to our page level view of our roller coasters in the database. And let's uh, combine this with our wheel of transactions. So what's going on here? Let's say this is my current status of uh, in time. So my next transaction, if I move the wheel, will be transaction number 10. But that's, that's kind of a problem because I have this roller coaster, and this roller coaster is valid from timestamp 10 onwards. But now, if I move this wheel with transactions, I will say 10 is in the past. So now I have a problem. So how does Postgres actually fix this problem? Well, I think everybody who has been working with Postgres knows, like, if, a, if nobody's looking so long that you actually need this number, nobody will be able to see this red roller coaster anymore and then the vacuum operation will come along and just removes it. Nobody needs this anymore. And since we are cleaning up pages, we can also remove this red relic, uh, the baron from this page because this has been a timestamp 105, it has been deleted. Nobody needs this view of the reality anymore, so we can remove this one as well. And now we, we cleaned up this page and if we move from uh, to transaction 10, if it moves to the past, there's no problem anymore. There's no data related to it. So now we can finally move. But now we hit another problem. Because this roller coaster is valid from timestamp 102, but that's also the first number I need in my wheel with transaction IDs. So how do we fix this? Because if I move one step further, this uh, roller coaster will be in the past, and that doesn't work. So we have to fix this one as well. And this is what we call freezing. 
we freeze this row in time, which means everybody who is visiting this page will be allowed to see this version of the Red Roller Coaster. And since this is the only image we have left on this page within our database, we can actually freeze this page entirely, which also means the next time the vacuum operation comes along, this page is frozen, so the vacuum operation can skip this page. And this way, the vacuum can skip a lot of work. So it's an important concept, freezing. <coughs> and now we removed all the old stuff, we have frozen this row, so now our wheel with transaction IDs can move forever and ever without having a problem for us. So that's nice. So how do we actually use transactions? Because you don't have to use transactions. Well, I would say using transactions is really, really easy. You just type begin. Begin means I'm starting a unit of work, begin my work. And you might say, well, I don't need it, I don't care about transaction, I'm using auto commit and I'm perfectly fine with it. I would say it's a valid argument in some cases, but I also just created some tests uh, to create, uh, to convince some developers to actually use transactions and why it matters. I created this extremely easy stored procedure and I ran it a lot of times. And if you commit, you're forcing stuff to happen. You have to create a new snapshot, you have to do the administration. It just takes time. So even if you don't care about transactions and you are very happy with auto commit, just committing itself alone already takes time. All right, so I can begin a transactions. I can do multiple updates without my, within my transaction. And at the end of this transaction, I decide to commit. And then I commit all the result of all three of these updates. It doesn't take additional time. All the writing is already done by the database. It's already written to the wall files. The moment you say commit, the only thing what happens is you're writing to the wall files. This transaction has actually been committed. So no matter how long your transaction is, committing is always fast. And if you don't want to commit, then you roll back, and then you roll back the result of all three of these updates. So, just going back to the transaction space and how multiple transactions work together, I have a start a transaction, so I will have a low transaction number. I do a select, which takes some time, and then during this select, another transaction does an update. In this case, the second select, the top one, it has a low transaction number, the update has a higher transaction number, but the update finishes before I do my second select. So my second select will be able to see the result of this update. But if this update is just a little bit later in time, now the update did not finish before I start my second select, and because it's running at the moment, I start my second select query, my second select will not be able to read the result of this update query. It's all about the moment you start your statement. Right, another example. Let's say I have transaction ID 102 and I upgrade, update a row in my database. And uh, I've been to this presentation, so I collect more stuff within my transaction and I update the same row again. And you might say, well, this is fine. But as a DBA, it still makes me kind of sad. Why does it make me kind of sad? Now you've been updating the same row twice within a single transaction. So if I now go back to my database page and see what is actually in my page, it looks like this. I have my red roller coaster, which was valid from timestamp 10 to 102, which is when I did the update with the latest transaction. Then I have a statement a picture of this roller coaster which is valid from timestamp 102 until timestamp 102 and I have one which is valid from 102 until forever. But now you're actually wasting space within the database because nobody will be able to read this, this picture of the red roller coaster which is diving down. It's only visible for you. So yes, use transactions, but please also use them wisely. Don't commit more than you need because this is just filling up space in my database, and that doesn't really make me happy. Right, another important concept we have to talk about today is locking, because if there's a lot of stuff going on in your database, and a lot of users are trying to do stuff with your database, 
you have to protect them as well from each other. And locking is a very important mechanism for this. Because let's say transaction 100 is uh, doing something with this red relic coaster. Maybe it's updating it, and then another transaction is coming in and wants to do the same update. And we can't update the same row with two different outcomes. It has to be either one or the other. But we can't have two transactions updating the same stuff at the same moment in time. So that's why we need locking as well. So how does locking work? Well, as soon as you read something, you already need to lock it. And why do you need to lock it? Because readers don't block readers, right? And writers don't block writers. So why do we need to lock it? Well, it will be a bit weird if you are reading something from a table. Let's say you're reading it all. And at the same moment, somebody else is dropping the table. Like, yeah, I don't need this anymore. That would be weird. It's like, yeah, I'm reading a lot of stuff. Oh, yeah, the rest is gone, sorry. So even though you are only reading information from a table, you still need to lock it. You need to protect your table from being changed. So how does this happen if I actually start a transaction and I do multiple statements? Because it has effects on locking. So let's say I do a select. Now I lock my table so nobody can drop it or remove a column from this table. And now I do a second select on this table. Now I have to carry two logs. One from the table I read within my transaction first, but I carry the length of this log while I'm doing my second statement. Why? Well, within my transaction, I'm allowed to go back and read again from the first table. So now for the length of these two selects, I need two logs. And if I do a third select within my transaction, now I am carrying actually three logs. So using transactions is nice, but be aware that also the locking is a little bit longer. And in this case, I'm just reading for uh, reading information. It's, it's not that important. But maybe my third statement is an update. And writers do actually block writers. So write logs are more heavy. So it prevents two transactions at the same time changing the same information, especially with a different outcome. And I would say this is a, a good way of updating stuff within a transaction. But if you are doing it the other way around, let's say you start with the update. Now I'm starting my transaction with a pretty heavy log, and then I'm doing select operations, which might take time, but all this time I am carrying this heavy write log with me. So if you are combining multiple statements within the transactions, please try to do the read before you actually do the write. <coughs> and then another one. Uh, I've seen a, very, a few very nasty bugs uh, with misuse of this, uh, this select for update clause. Um, it's basically you're doing a select, but you lock it like you are actually doing an update. So if I translate this to the, to the visuals I created before, I do a select for update. It's not exactly a right lock, but you, it's very comparable. So I use a slightly different icon for it. It's more a pencil than a fountain pen. Uh, but yeah, I'm doing the select for update. And then someone does an update at this moment in time. And if you're not combining your statements into a single transaction, somebody's actually updating your information, which you locked, but you only locked it for the length of your transaction. As soon as your transaction ends, you release all the locks. So now you think you protected all the information, but then another user comes in and actually changes your information, and then you do your write operation. This is hard to debug. So what's the proper way to do this? Well, you have to do it all in one transaction. You begin a transaction, then you do your select for updates, and then you do the actual update. So again, you begin your transaction, you do your select for updates, but you extend your transaction, you have to carry your log with you for the entire length of your transaction. And this is the only way to actually keep your data safe. So how do we solve this situation? Two transactions are coming in and they are both trying to update the same information. Well, it's basically flipping a coin. Who goes first? And if you're first, you get a log and the second transaction has to wait. And Postgres has a very fair system of locking. You give the lock to one transaction, 
and all the tra other transactions are queued. It's if you come in first, you will be served first. Pretty easy. Well, maybe not that easy. There's a catch. Uh, if you have foreign keys, you, the extent of your locks might actually travel down for your foreign keys. So you might think you're locking only one table, but in reality, be aware of your foreign keys because you might lock much more. So now I know how to lock a table. I'm lucky. I'm updating this red roller coaster and I get my lock. Good, nice. Then I have another transaction, and this second transaction is updating the Dutch Baron roller coaster. Well, nobody else is using it, so yeah, I'm happy. I can get the lock for this one as well. But now my first transaction decides, yeah, I would also like to update the Baron. Oh, but it is it is locked, so okay, I wait. I'm the first one in the queue, uh, but the other one will commit, and I will be next, and then I get the lock. Nice. But I will wait. I have to wait, but that's how it goes. But then the second transaction likes, yeah, I would also like to update, but I would like to update the red roller coaster. Oh, well, it's already locked. Well, that's not a problem. I will wait for that lock to disappear. I'm the first one in the queue. I'm good. I will wait. But now we have the situation where transaction one is waiting for two, and two is waiting for one, and one is waiting for two, and two is waiting for one, and well, you know, this, this presentation will never end this way. Uh, yeah, but this is a problem, and I think it's a very known problem. It's a deadlock situation. Uh, this is a very easy use case. We have only two transactions, and they are waiting for each other. But in reality, this can be an entire chain of transactions, and there might be 20 transactions involved where everybody's waiting for each other. And yeah, then Postgres is detecting this. It waits for a small amount of time, and then it's... Uh, it throws the coin and it decides like, yeah, you have to go, too bad. And then it kills one of them, and if you're lucky, the entire chain has been resolved, and one user, one session gets a, yeah, too bad, you were deadlocked, and I victimized you. Sorry. But that's how it goes. So locking, very important mechanism. Uh, it's easy to say locking is annoying, it's troublesome, and yes, it's not easy, but Locks are there not for fun. You really need them. It needs to protect the information and the data structures. So we can't live without it. Nice. Isolation levels. Uh, last topic, and I want to briefly touch on it. What are the isolation levels? I think in database theory, there are four isolation levels. The first one is read and committed. Uh, in some databases like DB2, you can information before it has actually been committed. And uh, Postgres, there's no such thing. The default one is the read committed uh, isolation level in Postgres. And that's how I've been treating transactions uh, for this entire talk already. Everything which has been committed will be visible for you. So this is our read committed isolation level. I have a long running transaction with multiple statements, but every statement has its own transaction snapshot. Every time I start a snapshot, I look again, what has been committed, what is the first number available, and what is still active. If I compare this with the repeatable read, which is the next step on the ladder of isolation levels, I still have the same transaction, but now I only determine my transaction snapshot for the first statement. So how does this impact something? Well, I don't get a new snapshot for my second uh, select and also not for my third select. I have to do it with the same snapshot of the, the moment I started my first statement in my transaction. So for read committed, if I do an update over here, the third transaction will be able to see the result of this update. Well, for repeatable read, my uh, select statement will not be able to see the result of this update because the snapshot I'm using is still the same snapshot I created at the moment I started my first statement in the transaction. So that was a lot to cover today. I think. If you hear this kind of stuff for the first time, it's, uh, it can be pretty rough. Uh, but I think it's, as a DBA, this is so important to really know. This is how you explain your 
developers, what is going on in the database and why do you see what you, uh, or why does the database return this information? So, what are the most important learnings from today? If I have a lot of transactions going on at the same moment in time, how does this all work together? How does a database determine this picture? What do I have to show to this specific user? Because there's so much going on, but it is not moving in time as long as you keep watching. So these mechanisms with X min, X max, this is how your database determines what transaction can see from what other transactions with which are running at the same time. It's such an important topic to understand as a DBA. And then also, how do I use a transaction and how do I use it in a proper way? How do I explain my developers how a select for update works? How do I explain logging problems and how can I resolve them? These are all issues as a DBA. They are so important to really know from the inside out. Because again, it's easy to be angry about logs. Logging can be so hard. Uh, we've been doing partitioning within Atien, and we struggled with logging of locking so much. It was such a hassle to get over it. But locks are important. They are there for a reason. And if there would be a lighter lock, then there would be a lighter lock. So be aware of them. Try to figure out, try to understand why are these locks there and what are they actually protecting? It's too easy to say, yeah, it's annoying. I want to get rid of it. And then finally, isolation levels. Isolation levels, I would say, you hardly come across them, but isolation levels are extremely important to understand. There's a famous company which went broke because they didn't understand how, trans uh, how isolation levels actually work. If you are checking the balance of an account before subtracting that amount from that account, if you do it wrong, your company might actually get broke, so yes. It is a hard concept to understand maybe, and maybe you only have to decide it once for your entire company. But if you make the wrong decision here, the impact can be huge. So that will be it for today. Are there any questions? There must be. Hello. <coughs> Can you go back to the sl last linear slide before the wheel came in? One hundred. I, I just go back and you say stop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's um, close to beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Almost beginning. I speed up a bit. Oh, oh getting oh. close. Yeah. No. One more. One more. Go ahead. Back. Yes. One more. Yes, uh, exactly. You are showing to 102 and 105. I wanted to ask the difference between the two. I didn't get it. 102, you got active list, yes. And 105. What was the difference between them? Between <laughs> sorry, sorry 102 be. and 105. Because uh, both are committed, right? They are both committed, so I will be able to see the results from these transactions if my transaction number is 106. Then 102 and 105 have been committed, they have finished, so I can see the result of these transactions. So they are the same, uh, from the point of view of a reader, they are the same, so they are committed and readable. Yeah, they are committed, mm -hmm. visible. From database perspective, they are equal at this moment for me. Cool, thank you. Okay, thank you. First of all, uh, there was a wooden roller coaster in your first slides? There was a? A wooden yes. roller coaster? Who the heck would join that? I don't know. It's, uh... <laughs> so, so, but th that's not a question I was going to do. So, you, you mentioned two uh, isolation levels, read committed and uh, select, uh, sorry, read, read committed. uncommitted, right? But you're still missing like linearizable reads. Yeah, and I serializable forgot, reads. I forgot to mention serializable. Serializable, uh, re linearizable, and there's also a committed across different nodes if you're going to a distributed database, for example. But let's put that aside. 
how do those affect the way you view it if you use one of those other two uh, uh, isolation levels? Because they are very important once we are in high throughput, low latency workloads. So just checking, what is the impact on the concurrency for the different snapshots? Correct. All right. Uh, I would say the more heavy your isolation level is, which read uncommitted is very lightweight and serializable is the heaviest, concurrency becomes harder and harder with an increasing isolation level because it's harder to do multiple things at the same time. You're carrying more information with you, more logs, more uh, constraints on transactions. My question is also on the same slide. Uh, you explained this with read committed isolation level. Yes. If the isolation level is serializable, does something change here? Oh, that's a good question. So does something change? No, it does not change because I view this from the perspective of a, a transaction snapshot. So the wording should change but the results should be the same because it's a transaction snapshot and I'm viewing what you can view based on a snapshot. So I think it will not change the story. But I'm also aware if I'm standing here with an unexpected question, I lose at least half of my brain. So if I'm wrong, please correct me. Right, so it but I think the story holds up. It wouldn't actually change the timeline if you used serializable. It's just that serializable prevents you from making a serialization error. So if you got into a dangerous, let's say, situation where you could cause a data integrity issue, like by reading after write, um, the serializable isolation level would not let you do that. It would just throw an error, and you would have to retry from the application. Yeah. What I learned about serializable, and for me, that's always been an easy way to remember it. If the order of statements would change the outcome, then uh, the database will throw you an error. Yeah, actually, I know people kind of asked half of the questions I meant to ask, but I still um, want to ask one more related to this. So my first question would be whether you, in your real life, in Ariane, had to raise isolation level over repeatable reads because I never had in my 40 years with databases. And thank you. Uh, and uh, what uh, actually, it's just suggestion because I really love this presentation, how it like illustrates all these aspects. So like my suggestion, how you can like answer the potential questions like this, what helps? If you uh, like present the graphics like you start two transactions in parallel, and uh, where you can really, what Jimmy just said, where you can really see the difference between isolation levels, if you start to update uh, kind of the same things, or like from the same table, and you can like, you can see the difference what will happen, because in one situation, it will not let you even to update before transaction. In the other case, you will, it will allow, but when you try to commit, it will say, uh-uh, no, no way, and uh, so that's, like very, very good to have, but um, and I, I think it's important to stress that extremely rarely you you need to like. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I, I still get get to, get to see it, but yeah, awesome. I, I love the graphics. So the question was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, going back to Sarah's question. Um, what happens if, uh, if a transaction using serializable is running for several hours? Or, for example, a PC dump, I think that PC dump user initiates a serializable transaction. What, what, what could happen to the database if, uh, if, uh, if, I have, if I have a hang session with a serializable level? Uh, I think that perhaps uh, Autovacuum uh, will fail or... Well, for what every long-running transaction, you can't clean up stuff. Uh, so as long as something is running, you can't throw things away with a transaction ID lower than that number. So for very long-running reports or inserts, that's, that becomes an issue. And if the transaction level is uh, serializable especially, 
uh, if the order of statements in your database would change the output, well, that might. So you might throw a lot of, uh, I don't remember the error exactly, but serialize because of serializable issues, your transaction have been aborted, please retry again. But on the other hand, if this is a completely new table and nobody looks at this table, it should be fine. We have plenty of time. No more questions? Oh. So serializable does not affect the order of things because you can just do them in serial as long as it doesn't affect the future outcome of the record, you can still not abort. What about linearizable? What about? Linearizable reads. Linear, linearizable reads? Isolation level linearizable reads means that you see things in order, so in a linear fashion. You start with the transaction, you go all the way through, and until you finish with all of those, you cannot uh, check back the, the, the results back to the user. So I, I was wondering if you knew about it. No, I never heard of okay. it. I think we are running out of questions a bit, so I would like to give you this one that should be able to do this faster. I think it's a slightly simplified overview. Can I do this? Should, there's a shortcut to go to the last, last slide, but. Getting there. Right, after listening to me for 40 minutes, a little over 40 minutes, you should be able to tell what's wrong here. I give the same training to developers within Atien, and as long as they are not able to answer this question correctly, they are not allowed to leave the room. <laughs> uh, there are actually two solutions uh, I discussed for this, uh, for this example. The function itself is correct, uh, but if you run this in real time, it might go wrong. And there was a Bitcoin company which actually went bankrupt because of this phenomena. So while you are still thinking about a new question, take a picture of this one and think about the two solutions you can come up with to prevent going bankrupt. Ooh, now I see a lot of hands suddenly. You don't have to answer this question, don't spoil it for the rest. But if you just have a question for me, not related to this example, please still raise your hand. We have time for one more. I didn't understand exactly when you showed the individual transactions and the difference when you do select, update, and select. And update can overlap with select. Does it mean that in one transaction you can have in parallel two statements, or how do, how do you mean it? In one transaction you can never have two statements at the same time, but if you have one statement and then you do another one afterwards, you still have the same transaction ID, so maybe it was transaction ID 100. But there might be a transaction which started after you, but is finished already here. So when you're doing the, same trans the second statement within the same transaction, and the other one has been committed, you can actually see the result of that transaction, which started later than your transaction did. So when you have this slide with begin and select, update, select, it means that there were commits in between these statements? Or no, do there don't have to be commits. You commit only at the end of your transaction. So even if you're not commit, well, yes, you have to, if another transaction commits, while you are not committing, you still see the result of the transaction who actually committed already before you start your new statement. Depending on the isolation level, but in the example it was read committed. Uh, okay. It changes the story with repeatable read. Excellent, thank you for an excellent talk and any other questions you can catch Dirk outside. Thank you very much. Cool, thanks a lot.